Okay, because we you now have this option of recording. That's awesome. I try not to say anything embarrassing myself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so, is there any introduction? Yes, yeah, I think Pamela does. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, welcome everyone to to our last Hawk Talk of the semester, and today we have the honor and pleasure of Dr. Farina King. And she will be presenting on her research on uh, Intermountain Indian School. And we thought it fitting to tie it in during the week of, American, of our American Indian Symposium. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. King. All right. So I, it's kind of tricky because I have you guys on this side and, and you over there, Pamela. So I don't think I'll try and switch between you know, what I'm looking at. <laughs> But I'm really yeah. the professor, like, I look at people in their <laughs> eyes and in their faces. Um, but, uh, well, I enjoy um, being here and appreciate this invitation. Thank you to Pamela for helping to organize this and all she's doing with Hop Talks. Because I, I really value all the research and everything that everyone's doing here. It's kind of sometimes... Uh, it can be a thankless work in some ways and other ways yeah people say oh it gets me tenure or whatever um different reasons but it can be really challenging especially at an institution that has such heavy um you know for good reason to heavy requirement and expectation of teaching and so i really appreciate these forums and all the research and efforts everyone's involved in and devoting to and also a thank you to the faculty research committee are any of you involved in that here okay well a shout out to them and all that they do and i'm so grateful for um, the opportunity to benefit from that grant and that that exists here and there's that support as well for faculty so I definitely want to um, recognize the faculty research committee and um, also recognize um, I am often considered a, a wanderer a visitor and uh, exiled from my own homelands as a Diné woman but the Neh, uh, the Lagana woman, which I'll explain is a part of my presentation, is a lot of um, autoethnography ties into my research because I focus on my community and focus on um, even my own family stories that drew me into my research. And so a lot of times I explain to people my research is, um, ties me and brings me to my family. And I don't think everyone can say that in the same way that that I do and so that's something I have to consider but while I'm a visitor here um, on recognizing all the diverse communities here especially the Cherokee Salagi communities and I'm grateful um, to be here in their midst and doing my best to try to connect more with the communities and great people who are here in this area and, and recognizing them and how they're shaping the way that I approach even my own research and my own peoples and ideas of indigeneity and Native American and indigenous studies that is my primary field but through the lens of, and questions of history and as a historian so trying to bridge these different disciplinary approaches and, and takes on on these overarching questions that I pose about um, why is education so important who controls education how has education been used um, or appropriated in different ways to shape identities and shape sense of peoplehood and particularly um, tracing people's sense of place, their identity and how it's entangled with um, where they're from, where they're coming from and, and then where they decide to recognize or plant themselves as home. So let's see if I can get this working. Okay, awesome. Um, so first, I need to introduce myself. I introduce myself in Navajo, which I will present my clans to you. And that's what I'm going to say now to you. Um, I introduce you um, first 
introduced you all to me by presenting my matrilineal clan. My mother is Anglo-American of Irish and English descent going back, but from Michigan. And my dad is Navajo, and I say that I'm born for my father's clans, which is um, the Towering House people, Kiaani, and the Black Street Woods people, Sinajini. And then I conclude by saying, that's what makes me a woman uh, or a person. Like a man would say, that's what makes me a man, that's what makes me a person. And um, traditionally, how Navajos even asked, where are you from? It asks, where's your, uh, where's your umbilical cords buried? Because when you were born, your, um, your parents, your family, they paid very particular attention to where they bury your umbilical cords. And that was where they felt you would gravitate towards that space. So they put it by a loom or in, by the Hogan, the traditional dwelling place, and want you to be drawn home. And, and that was a sense of home. They put it by the corral if they valued the livestock and the horses and wanted you to be drawn there. So asking where, where are your umbilical cords buried, that would be saying, where are you from? Where are you drawn to as home? And these images here, um, that's me as a baby wrapped in the Navajo cradle board. I was born in Tuba City. And again, as I said, a lot of my research is interconnected with who I am and my upbringing, and that shapes my perspective, my approaches to these uh, stories and histories. Because it was growing up uh, between the Navajo Nation lands, uh, the Nebuchadnezzar, as we call Navajo lands, um, in Tuba City, Window Rock. I lived there as a small child, but my dad worked for Indian Health Services, and that's my father as a young man. Um, pictured there wearing the tie, and his mother, my Chanelle uh, Atsa, jo Johanna Haskowski, and that part of my family are from New Mexico, around what's considered the checkerboard area, um, Rehoboth, New Mexico, around Gallup, uh, Yambuto, and um, towards Zuni, Red Springs. And so those are seen as my ancestral homelands where uh, many of my ancestors' umbilical cords are buried and um, where most of my, my relatives now live. And it was the stories growing up that drew me to these studies and this research was one, finding out my dad went to boarding school and that when he was five years old, without warning from his parents, he never spoke English before, he never you know, saw a toilet before, lived in a home that didn't have running water or electricity. He was dropped off at a boarding school and uh, his parents, for whatever reason, you know, they decided not to tell him or really prepare him for it. They just dropped him off and he was left there. And it, it was you know, traumatic even in just that beginning of he didn't know what a toilet was and he took it apart because he was just fascinated by it. And, and then he was punished for that, you know, that curiosity. And also being told, like, imagine if I'm just speaking to you all in Navajo, you know, how would that make you feel? And I'm expecting you to know everything that I'm saying and going to quiz you on it. So a lot of um, different forms of trauma there, um, but my dad's stories, he, I did know that he ran away a couple times from boarding school, and I asked, well, why did you run away? Was it so horrible? And, and nowadays, we do have these larger conversations that are more focused on that intergenerational trauma of boarding schools and very negative portrayals of it, especially um, since... David Wallace Adams came out with his book, a seminal work called The Education for Extinction in the 1990s. So, you know, he called it out as these were forms to exterminate people, to wipe out their um, Indianness, you know, their identities. Um, but on the other hand, when talking to my father, he was resistant to that kind of approach. He was like, I'm grateful for my education. I learned a lot. I'm glad I went. You know, and he was kind of became a little defensive when I started to ask him about it in various ways. And then I said, well, you ran away, you know, two times. And one time you almost died. You got caught in a snowstorm and barely was saved by um, like a rancher, you know, uh, walk, wandering there. Just happened to miraculously find him. And he then said to me very in a strong voice, I did not run away from the education. 
that kind of stuck with me because I've thought a lot about, well, what is education and how do we make sense or understand what, um, and especially for me, focusing on 20th century history, this is recent. This is my dad who has influenced me very directly. Recent histories, people are living, in, and some are pretty young, who have been through similar experiences, especially among the Navajo that I'm going to explain as well of, of what I'm talking about when I say um, most Navajos were not sent to schools. You know, it's one thing to talk about education in terms of sending them, sending children to schools that you're, that most people are now used to that format of a, there's a school day and a teacher and that kind of set up. Um, they were not sent to schools most, I mean, until after World War II. In 1946, after World War II, 75% of Navajo children had never been to a school. So that's to give you some framework. Um, most people who study anything about Indian boarding school history, you focus on the late 1800s, the early 20th century, and, um, you know, heard of maybe the Carlisle Institute that was opened in 1879, Richard Henry Pratt, who was infamous for his saying, kill the Indian um, in him, save the man. And then, um, then you have the Merriam Report, which was a report of given to the government, the government looked into, that basically ripped apart, you know, these policies of education and criticizing it and condemning it for being not only ineffective, but hurtful. And that's when most federal, and I'm, I'm focusing on federal uh, governmental boarding schools started to close because um, there's many kinds of schools that Native Americans have been involved in, sent to public state schools, um, denominational schools that are boarding or non-boarding, day schools. So real vast spectrum of different schools, but I primarily trace federal uh, US government run uh, boarding schools that are primarily run through the Bureau of Indian Affairs and then Bureau of Indian Education. And there's still schools like that in our own area, Sequoia High School, right? Um, and it's history and so they, and all these, perspectives and experiences in these different schools, they very diversify in so many different ways, especially even among, you know, Navajos themselves and even at the same school. You know, I've, I've talked to so many different former students through oral histories that I've done first uh, intensely through my doctoral research and now through my future projects that I'm developing and, and involved in including the one being supported about um, student and particularly focused on Navajo student experiences in the Intermountain Indian School. So um, for me this is very personal because not only did my dad go to boarding school but my grandmother did. She went to the Albuquerque Indian School and I was in the archives and I saw her grade in there in the archives, like her report card and other files about her. You know, so my family are in the archives in these ways and it's very personal and direct. It's like, oh, my grandma wasn't very good at math at that time, you know, or, or finding things out there. And then her father went to a boarding school. So several generations did go and some Navajos they did go to um, those schools as early as the 1800s like Carlisle Institute there's a notorious image of um, Tom Torlino a before and after image of, of trying to propaganda uh, use propaganda use these images to say oh they're being whitened you know at that time and now they're being used by scholars like David Wallace Adams saying it was erasing you know their indigeneity but um, again the interesting aspects about it, like asking my dad about his experiences and he emphasizing he did not run away from the education, is um, he, it's very difficult, you know, because it wasn't all negative, very mixed experiences, and they don't want to discredit or, you know, be seen only as victims in their lives. They don't want those broad, um, brush strokes of us as scholars, especially, we like to generalize, and I, especially historians, we've been criticized for this, is like, oh, you just want to summarize, you want to generalize these things. Well, the art of the story is recognizing the richness, the intricacies of every story, and letting the stories also speak for themselves, too, 
rather than, and that's always a balance of how we analyze and then how we gather it. So with this project um, that, I'm, that I'm focusing on, I want to talk to you about um, more, it's in a preliminary stage, <laughs> an early stage at least, not even preliminary, I, I'm into it, I, um, and the project's running, but it's at an early stage, so I want to talk about the process and some of these early insights, but please bear with me, and I am very excited for the feedback and conversations we can have, because I am still very much right in the thick of it. Um, I, I have more interviews to do as summer starts up in May and June, and I'll be in the field, you know, as you say, doing the research that the FRC grant is uh, enabling me to do. And so I just received it. So some of the, I don't know, some of the speakers before have had already, you know, some time to start publishing about their works or different things. I'm doing the research now, it's unfolding. But a part of um, the project that I proposed was a focus, it was an oral history project of um, gathering stories of Navajo students who went to a particular boarding school. And it's, it's very special kind of boarding school that sticks out from others that I'm going to share with you some of that background and insights about called the Intermountain Indian Boarding School. So as I explained um, before, Navajos had a distinct experience from many other tribes like, I mean, even in this area, probably most of you are aware or have some familiarity with Cherokee and Cherokee education and, and right, many of them were exposed to um, English or euro like Euro-American models of education way back, like back as early as 1700s or earlier, right, with, with different forms of contact. How that played out was different and especially um, denominational influences on education. Well, Navajos, as I said, most did not have that kind of exposure to schooling and this schooling model until very recently, right? Just in the 50s, really. And Intermountain Boarding School was a part of these uh, boarding schools that when most boarding schools were shut down, federal Indian boarding schools were shut down by the 20s and the 30s, and definitely World War II, that, that took most attention of the government, resources, a total war, you know, mobilized the whole country and everything. There wasn't the kind of funding to support Indian education in the same way. Um, when World War II ends, and not to skip as well, there was Indian New Deal and the Indian uh, Commissioner of Affairs, John Collier, he did invest and change education as well for uh, American Indians by trying to state, let's teach them to be Indian. It's okay to be Indian now. So there's all these kind of vicissitudes as well with the federal government's approach, or at least their um, stated claims of what they're trying to do um, in terms of Indian education or, or schooling. So he, uh, Collier, did open up day schools and tried to move away from boarding schools too. But for Navajos, there was this need, even from Navajos themselves, asking for schools, including boarding schools, because after World War II, um, the World War II exposed many Navajos, connected them to market economy, to wage earning jobs. So it was a huge transition for them, a revolution, arguably, where this was the time where the Navajo Nation formed, a tribal government formed, and the war, many of them served in, you know, even just manufacturing or the factories and, and the different war efforts domestically and abroad as soldiers in the military. And it exposed them to different you know, peoples and uh, again, influencing how they identified in various ways. And so many Navajos then started to say, well, you know, these other communities have schools. Schools is tied to you know, how you advance in this economy. So we need that, that's what we need. And, and there was this more solidified tribal government and tribal leaders, officials, who would represent the Navajo people and say, well, we need these schools. So they were calling for that to the government. And there was a time, right, not too long after the war of 1947, there was a horrible blizzard and it devastated many Navajos. Um, and also there were issues even though the war gave a boost to Navajo um, opportunities in the wage earning economy, after the war, a lot of jobs were closed. And so some who then had transitioned to you know, those kind of wage earning jobs 
they lost those jobs and there was a spike in unemployment and different issues that are you know categorized as socioeconomic but troubles there and so the navajo leaders as well beseeched the government for help and and called for help as it was seen you know they were claiming we're in a dire you know dire situation here and education is a part of getting us out of this out of this slump the struggles we're having <clears throat> and um harry truman president you know in the post-war years he declared a, a emergency like a form of a national emergency among the navajo nation because it was so horrific of just people who were starving some people were starving unable to provide and, and feed themselves so even i've talked to interviewees where going to boarding school was life saving for them, where they got food, where they had a place to shower, they had a home, a sh uh, you know, a shelter, and even my own relatives. I've talked to some cousins where she said, one of my cousins took a shower every day, multiple times, anytime she could, because she loved that water, and being able to have that access to the water. So these are another part, an important part of understanding the context. Anyway, in this call and shout out for help, then the government decides to pass this uh, form of, um, they call it Long Range Rehabilitation Act. And it was for Navajos and Hopi, the Navajo Hopi Long Range Rehabilitation Act, because Hopi has also had similar struggles. They're also in the same area of the Southwest, um, all in Arizona. Navajos, the um, Dene Vicaya encompasses um, at least the reservation boundaries that were drawn after the Treaty of 1868 cover, uh, go into Utah, Southern Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. And even though um, some ancestral homelands of Navajos was also a part of Colorado around the Four Corners area, that was not included under the reservation uh, boundaries. And then later, the, the reservation has expanded in ways that Navajos have negotiated or you know, bought certain properties. And that's why even in the area I am, it's called checkerboard, right? Because you hop in here, the part of the reservation, you hop off, that's a Gallup City part or different parts like that. Um, so Inner Mountain was a school that opened as a part of that funding provided from Congress and the community, I mean, from the government in a response to the call for help. And also they saw it as a crisis, the Navajo problem, and these are quite literally the words they use. Navajo problem also um, addressed the issue of Navajos aren't in school. This is a problem. You know, now we have this law that all kids who are school age, they need to be in school. So we need to do something. We need to intensify these programs. We have to get, and we're talking, you know, 18,000 students, right, who are school age and 75% of them were, uh, were not in school. So pretty, a lot of students were not in school. And the government then says, we have to do something about that. And they open up some boarding schools, on reservation day schools, and those are other projects I'm involved in, in, in tracing these different dynamics there. But Inner Mountain, um, it was a facility that was a military base. Um, it was Fort Bushnell, Bushnell in Brigham City, Utah, which is in the northern part of Utah. I'll show a map in a minute. And um, they decided to convert this to a boarding school specifically for Navajos, only for Navajos. And Brigham City is in northern Utah, which is at least a couple hundred miles away from Navajo ancestral homelands and Navajo territory, basically. And so it was a school all for Navajos, but the children would definitely, it, it was, you know, pretty distant for them to be sent all the way there, bus. Um, it did focus on older children. So initially they said only, you know, high schoolers or maybe middle, middle school age. But in my research, I found you know, give or take some different situations there, even some pretty young age children went there. But the school did officially open in 1950, by 1950, only for Navajos, and it became the largest Indian boarding school in U.S. history, with up to 2,000 students at a time, and they were all Navajo. So that's something as well of why it triggers my interests and approach. Also, I have experience on studying Navajo Mormon histories of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> Mormonism is very 
it, it is prevalent among Navajos and, and there are a number of congregations and it's got a strong network. And so Brigham City was a predominantly Mormon town and there, it, the school employed many Mormons and there was a seminary program right next to the school. And even though it was non-denominational government school, um, there was a strong Mormon presence and influence that you can't deny. So that's another reason why I was also drawn into it because it was an intersection of so many of um, my areas of focus and, and what I've delved into in my research before. And then to add on top of it all, like it was just calling to me, you know, when projects are like, you better work on this because all these things line up for you, is that um, a couple of friends of mine who are professors at Brigham Young University, the um, LDS church run school, one um, in particular, his name's Dr. Mike Taylor, Taylor, he focuses on Native American literature. He reached out to me randomly and said, Rena, can you tell me about Intermountain Indian School? There are all these thousands of sources on Indian students' literature and their poetry and their writings. And he said, I want to, you know, write something. I want to get involved in this and do a study about it. And he just asked me out of curiosity. But then I felt, I saw, heard about different grants out there, and particularly some that were interdisciplinary grants, trying to encourage collaboration. And I thought, you know, I, I responded to him and said, hey, do you want to collaborate on something, you know, and do something with this? Um, I, I love oral history. That's my primary methodology of talking to people and hearing their stories. But I think there's a lot there that can revise the narrative and what's commonly taught or emphasized in Indian boarding school histories of focusing on the creative works and the creativity, different forms of agency, you know, that the students had and not just the brushstroke of it's all negative or even the other way, it's all positive, but the complicating it and delving into the intricacies of students' experiences and their realities during that time. And so we were able to get a seed grant through the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, and I want to thank them, shout out to them for all their great support to scholars and different scholarship. And um, that was the beginning of um, developing these, uh, searching for other grants and support that for the project that is an overarching project I'm doing in collaboration with now Dr. Mike Taylor and Dr. James, James Swenson, who is an art historian, is that we wanted to create an exhibit called Returning Home Inner Mountain. So um, yeah, just to feature here, I'll show this really quick. Well, right here you have a poem one of the poems from uh, a Intermountain student that Mike Taylor found, because he was, he was digging all these poetries and really awesome things. And um, just to share here, even within that, you know, there's intricacies of his insights about what he called Indian school and me. Dawn wrapped in dull white gives birth to brilliant light while the shadows of the night disappear in mortal fright. Oh, what a tragic sight, damned if that makes me right. The whole world locked uptight. Something in me wants to fight. In fact, I just might, for who knows what is right. Henry Tinhorn. So he wrote and actually did an, a number of self-published um, works. I'll go up. So, oh, sorry, I get cut off. But that's the title. That's a flyer we started to distribute where we each did different parts. Mike Taylor was to focus on that literature, what the students wrote and their poetry, creative writings. James Swenson was starting to analyze the artwork because there were a lot of great pieces of art that students developed while they were there. And then I was trying to gather stories of what students said and even trying to look for some artists or different poets, writers who at least wrote, you know, during that time, ask them about their experiences. And we're creating a traveling exhibit where we're going to feature those creative works, the art, the poetry, and the oral stories, you know, the oral histories I gather, and we'll bring it to the Navajo Nation. Because a lot of exhibits, there have been exhibits about Intermountain before. They've been more a general approach to it, but they've been in Brigham City again, off of Navajo lands away from home. And something we found with this, with this project and research is how much, um, how much 
these works show that students sustained ties to home, or they at least, you know, were critical about their education. They were questioning, you know, this very Eurocentric and still, in many ways, assimilationist approach to education that was like, you got to learn how to walk in the white man's world. I mean, these were the kind of the phrases they were taught um, going to school, even though, yes, after John Collier, wasn't, it wasn't like Richard Henry Pratt saying, we're going to kill the Indian in you. They weren't like that anymore. And there were different forms uh, for Native American students to be involved in culture, having maybe an annual powwow or like learning songs and, and not being punished like they did in the past for speaking their language with each other. In an old Navajo school, the children still continue speaking Navajo to their friends. Right. But there's different forms of trauma that happen because many of those students who still kept up their language, they stopped teaching their children because it's still ingrained in them. What's the useful language? What's the most important language? Even if they married a fellow Navajo fluent speaker, they don't teach their children Navajo. So this has become an issue continuing in education today. So this was a flyer we shared because a part of the approach and methodology, too, and is um, very much, I am thankful for the support of Navajo communities and that Intermountain has a very active Navajo Alumni Association that meets annually. And I'll show you know the flyer for their reunion later and um, I'll be going to them and we've presented our work to them and have been getting feedback, you know, not just from individuals, but trying to go to organizations and communities and I've worked with Navajo chapter communities before and also the Navajo Nation Human Research Review Board. For this project, I've mostly been talking to Navajos who live off of Navajo Nation, actually. And I've been interested in why, you know, why have they settled away from Navajo Nation and what ways do they still maintain ties as they've been not necessarily exiled in their words, but relocated and still maintaining the Navajo identity. So here's some images, sorry, they're <laughs> sideways, of where we went to the Utah State University archives, and that's where most of those sources have been kept, the collections of the student writings. And that's Alexa, Alexa West is a former teacher who's been, um, we've interviewed her and talked about how it was like teaching Navajos, um, writing and these creative projects, and Dr. Mike Taylor looking through the different sources. To give you an idea, of these are what will be featured in the exhibit and what's also inspiring the kind of questions I'm asking students about their writings. And um, this also relates to the influence from other projects that I'm doing of, of trying my, my key overarching questions in all kinds of research I have, and as depicted by this image here, is um, this is what I call an, an earth memory compass, but in Navajo education, it's shown in different forms and it embodies um, Navajo philosophy and central concepts. And particularly even, you know, with just how we learn, how we grow. And it's connected to the seasons, sacred mountains, sense of place. And so my question is, through all the different kinds of education and particularly at boarding school that challenges these kind of teachings because they're not learning it from the elders as they did and as their ancestors did since time immemorial. Um, how do Navajo students learn about these things and how do they connect or reconnect to it? Um, and especially through the kind of creative works that are articulations of that. Their stories that the oral histories I do, they're reflecting as adults much later in life. And this is, you know, to depict the different kind of narratives you have about Indian education and Indian boarding school history was, um, as I was doing research, I dug up this, uh, was off of a newsletter from the National Indian Youth Council that started to form in the 60s, and they were very critical of the Intermountain Boarding School, because as many of you might be wondering, well, what happened to this boarding school, this large, colossal boarding school in many ways, is um, by 1974, less Navajos were going, and there was 
great criticism of boarding schools in general as this image depicts, right? It's showing the kids are being imprisoned. It's a form of incarceration and reformation similar to prison systems. And um, that's, you know, from the National Indian Youth Council who actually targeted Inner Mountain specifically and did try to push an investigation about some forms of mistreatment or issues that happened there. And I mean, there was a riot that broke out in 1969 that I, I'll show you an image of that students went, you know, people say, people say crazy where there were mass uh, rapes, a blackout, and it was a riot on the campus, 1969. And then um, they decided to open the school to an intertribal school, not only Navajos, by 1974. And there were more riots because what happens when you had a Navajo-only school and Navajos, this is what students literally said. They said, Navajos thought we were, you know, the kids on the block. This was our school. And they were not happy that other tribes were coming in. And there were, you know, conflicts between the students even fights, I interviewed a teacher where she ha was on uh, watch duty and she saw a line of um, Navajo students, females, and these were all women, a uh, young woman, and a line of non-Navajo Native American students. And they were, they had like bats and rocks. They were ready to have it at each other. And she said, trying to break it up, down, don't fight, don't fight. And they just picked her up and threw her out there and they were at it. Right? And so there were these kind of riots as well with the change in 1974. And then the school was closed by 1984. Um, and it closed, right, in, in these kind of issues with boarding schools that happened. So 1950 to 1984 was when the school was functioning, but it was Navajo only until 1974. And we've been primarily focusing on the, on the Navajo only years, um, pre-1974 in our project and in my oral histories because there's so much entangled there. I mean, when it was open to inner, in, in an inner tribal school, you had people coming from all over, all different indigenous nations, including Oklahoma, including Alaska, and very diverse. So that's, that's another project. And here, you know, to help you find it, there's Brigham City right there uh, on the north, you see it, and where Utah is. I'm assuming you guys know, but, you know, <laughs> and this was, once the school closed in 1984, it kind of became the haunted place, right, um, and it was left vacant and neglected. Finally, they did bulldoze it all recently, so it's been all bo bulldozed, and what was interesting about that is there was artwork on the wall. I mean, think about NSU, how we have artwork on the walls. Some of those were bulldozed, but some were saved. Um, one man I talked to, Brad Peterson, he helped save images like this one. And as you can see, what did, what did students paint on the wall? This is an image of Monument Valley, their home. Their home, they were recreating home for them on the sites of the wall. So one interviewee that I had, one of the first interviews I ever did was with Jesse Holliday. And I've done several interviews with him, um, thanks to this grant, too. I've been able to go back. He lives in um, Monument Valley, which was those views. It's, it's basically that landscape that's been I, um, become an icon and a symbol of the American West with the buttes and the mesas. That's on, on Navajo Nation. And there's Jesse with his father, who was a medicine man, Hatase. And um, Jesse went to Intermountain Boarding School when he was a young boy and um, talking to him about it, he, he doesn't have a lot of memories about it, but the ones he had really stuck out to me. How he remembers going to the pool. And for Navos, what I realized is, you know, we're desert people. We're not exposed to that kind of immersion in water. So I still have relatives who are terrified of water. They are terrified of it. They don't want to go in a pool to this day, you know, and there was a, full like Olympic size pool I hear or at least that's how they remember it and and they were learning how to swim there and that could have been some challenges for him and, and he brought up I remember the pool and I dived in and I almost cracked my head open it like it was a bit of traumatizing for him about being exposed to it but he he learned in boarding school um that that's where he discovered that he loved art and he started to paint and was able to enter contests for his work and, and painting and artwork and, 
And as you can see, that was the first one was one of a drawing. This is of his father in Monument Valley sitting a, a photograph. But then here's another image he drew, right, as a young man. And as you can see, like he he's removed hundreds of miles away from home, but he's still articulating, as he said, even in his interview, my greatest teacher was my father. And that he was able to record even his father's prayers and listen to them. And his father would pray for rain. And these things stuck with him, even though he would be away from home for months at a time, there's still these connections that he could draw, literally draw out, right, on his, on his paper, and that he remembers. This is by, um, right now, an unlisted artist, and it's in the collections of the Utah State University, it has rich collections, as Dr. Mike Taylor um, sh shared with me at first. And this image really stood out to me because this was done by an Intermountain student, they collected some. Unfortunately, they only like took these pictures of them, so we don't know what happened to the originals. But I and I had to take a picture of it within its uh, little plastic covering. But I hope you can see there. You know, there's he's looking into the clouds, and can you see what he's looking at? This young man who also looks like Jesse, like he's in Monument Valley. What's he looking at? Can you see it? The skyscrapers, the city. So there are these major questions that they have to face of like, where's going to be my home? Where's my future? What is education leading me to? And I can't read all of this, but um, what's cut off at the top there, this is one of the poems uh, shared in the books that they had these comp compilations and um, school publications of student works. And this one was called, um, I think, Citizen, Good Citizen by Tommy Nakai. And I'm just going to read part of it, but basically, um, it's, I want you to pay attention to how, what is the student, you know, expressing here? He says, um, a good citizen is kept informed, informed by black and white, person to person, and plastic stripes, but doesn't lose his mind on um, black plastics. But what's so special about that? Being heard, seen, and read. It mostly covers violence protests, demonstrations, war casualties, bitter words, and of course, about some golf balls having been on a trip to their doom. Obviously, we are getting more information, oh, how to violate laws and regulations, intentionally or unintentionally, and discouraging our creator. It is clear to him who is capable of judging mankind that both the so-called old and young generations will unfortunately will themselves to the world of self-destruction. And so he wrote this about, I think this was sometime between the 60s and 70s, excuse me for um, not checking that right now. But um, again, this is a student in an Indian boarding school who's really showing critique of his society. And there's one right under it, Mr. President. That's also calling out even the president and students there are challenging, you know, the status quo, or at least what's being presented to them as the status quo and thinking about it. And this was evidence of that um, riot that I was talking about. And I, I talked to one student informally, and this is an issue too of where you have formalized oral histories that were taught in academia, and then what comes out in the informal, casual conversations is very important too, of, of just me being there. It's similar to ethnography and, and anthropological approaches, but I was at the reunion and met a, a woman who was went to school there when the riot, this the big riot in 1969 broke out, and she remembers dormmates herded her and the girls in her dorm to an area to protect them. But basically the lights went out and there were some young men who then went rampaging students and were raping young women and, and um, you know, destroying things left and right. And some young woman she knows jumped from their, they were on a second story at least, or they jumped from the windows to escape being raped. And she remembered that, telling me that. So these were stories that I'm sure she did not want to be on file about. She didn't want her name affiliated with. But these are stories that I hear and am able to learn about, you know, that experience. And she was safe. But, you know, what she might have felt of being, feeling that fear or intimidation. But besides these darker sides, there are very dark sides to intermountain stories that I've only given you a sliver of. But there also are, you know, 
the moments that are bright and through the art, you know, students expressing that. This was a gift a student gave to um, the teacher and she's holding it. It was a teacher we met, an English teacher who, who held up, a, a student gave it to her. And just, you know, the beauty and the colors and how they're still able to think about their life. I hear stories of even my aunt re recently, Aunt Phyllis said, I remember the good days with your dad raising the sheep, that a lot of the education for Navajo youth was caring for the sheep. Sheep herding was significant. So, and goats, caring for the goats as are depicted in these images. Um, I'll see very quick, I, I only have a couple more slides, thank you. Um, this is just a clip of one of the interviews because I wanted to give you a glimpse of that, that I interviewed Pauline So. She went to Intermountain, and something as I was thinking about trying to hear stories about the creative works and that kind of um, just innovation that students were able to have and do at Intermountain was they came in some unexpected ways sometimes. Like it wasn't necessarily the formal, I'm in an art class, and I'm gonna paint a picture, or my teacher assigned me to write a poem, so I'm gonna do it, and maybe I'll get um, creative with it too, but I heard stories of just how young women especially they would knit and they would learn from their doormates how to make you know these different creations even if it was clothing like socks and stuff it still was a form of creativity and then um, I learned from Pauline about another that was really interesting so you'll hear me I talk All right, so as you can tell, that was a fun, you know, I never thought of that, that the students like wrote songs and they were trying to mail them to popular singers who they liked saying, pick my song, choose it. So they were songwriters too, is what I found, which was pretty fun. Uh oh, how do I get out of it? I know. It is open behind the green, so click outside the green. The oh, green. okay. Yeah, minimize that. Or... Thank you. So I guess it took us out of it. Okay. Yeah, just minimize. Awesome. Minimize. Thanks. And then lastly, um, another interviewee who I talked to, Lorena Antonio, she was Miss Intermountain. So they had a Miss Intermountain pageant, and you know they had a talent portion and different aspects. And it was one of her English teachers who, you know, I think a creative works teachers who encouraged her to apply and she was more an athlete she was into basketball and different sports but i found you know that she, through being able to um present about navajo cultures that have arts ingrained in them like weaving or basketry that she was able to talk a lot about that and this is an image of her because with the reunion that they have annually they've reinstated a Miss Inner Mountain, and they actually nominate a Miss Inner Mountain again, and uh, she was the last one in 2016, she'll be running it again, and there's her in 1974, and she was one of those speakers where she loved her time at Inner Mountain. She wishes it never closed. She wishes she could send her children there, and she just really appreciated it, as well as Pauline, but I think Pauline said it best of like, if you did not disrupt or you know go against the grain if you did as you were told you don't have problems you know and you can have fun but there's those other outliers that i trace of what happens to the naughty students that became pretty dark of what could happen including some that were given medication like or that are now prescribed for bipolar people or different things that that are now happening um, that medication is now being used in these different ways. They had like a little sort of jail, you know, somewhere to keep them if they um, overstepped 
or needed disciplinary action and, and quite still some uh, physical disciplinary action that, that could be brutal. They also shaved heads of students when they were uh, misbehaving and that was unheard of in other boarding schools. Some connect that wondering, does that have to do with uh, some of the Mormon educators who have read some scripture about um, the shame of shame, shaving heads and what that means. But so there's these other areas that are pretty dark. Again, when I went to the Intermountain Reunion and they'll be having another one this, this summer that I plan to go to and present these findings and discussion and what we're doing with Dr. Mike Lee and Dr. Swenson is we're going to create pamphlets that feature some of the artwork and poetry to share with the students because they haven't seen these for years, if at all, some of them. Um, but when I was at the reunion, what's beautiful about it is they have a microphone and people come up and share their stories there. And most of them are shared in Navajo, almost all Navajo, at least with the, there's an intertribal association. And so they do more of maybe a bi, you know, biannual event, like every other year, I mean, and every other year event. But uh, for the Navajo Association, and, and for m many years, it was Navajo only, um, you have many former Navajo students, and I meet them everywhere. I was in Dallas, and I met an Intermountain alumni there, and she's talking about how she resettled in Dallas and her memories, and um, different parts of Utah, Arizona. I meet people with some kind of connection, like I had a grandparent or somebody who went to it. So um, this is still a journey in the making, and I am so honored and appreciative for those who share their stories. They open their lives to me. Some of them have to reopen trauma, which is difficult, and some, you know, the fond memories and just even the nostalgia of how they long for those times and reminisce very happily about it. So um, I'm looking forward to learning more in the in the days ahead. And thank you so much for supporting this work. And I would love any feedback and talking to you all about it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, no problem. <laughs> and I know I took, I hogged up a lot of the time and just a lot to say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Brenda, you know, as, as I, well done, man. This is just, and it's rocking my synapses in my head a little bit, you know. It's I really, a lot. Yeah, it's a lot to take in. But, at, but, what I attached to was, especially since you said through 1984, mm -hmm. I, was in, I was in Oklahoma and I sat here and was reflecting on what I was learning in about our land, about what we were learning. I don't recall having any conversations about boarding schools in general, let alone Intermountain, which was functional while I was at school. Yeah. So because I'm an educator preparer, preparer of educators, put it that way, yeah. um, in conversations that Grace and I have had, you know, I'm, I have questions like how how do we inform our future teachers to acknowledge history from the past that is impacting the kids that they are teaching currently? Mm -hmm. And maybe they would encounter some ancestry from inter mm -hmm. but because it is rough, you know, boarding school uh, uh, time affected many tribes, um, especially here at Northeastern as we prepare educators. How, how do you see that embedded in the curriculum or how do we reach future teachers so that all of history is included. 
Yeah. Well, this is. I, mean, really, I know that's a deep, really deep question. No, it's an important question. Is that um, in Canada, for example, they had a whole truth and reconciliation commission because at least there's been a more national um, conversation and a recognition of the trauma. For the, for Canada, they had residential schools. This is what they called them. But it's very parallel and similar to. Um, Indian boarding school experiences. And they've had certain legislation and policies passed to actually require curriculum to include at residential schools. So it's interesting, because I know First Nations, um, some friends from First Nations communities and um, others who study that those dynamics. And I've, I've tried to at least expose myself to it and become more familiar with it myself as I teach about histories of indigenous education. And there's a lot of comparisons made between Canada and the United States. And so um, in the United States, I know there is an effort to at least um, do something similar to have maybe some kind of truth and reconciliation commission to talk about it. How do we educate more about it generally? Um, there is an organization that's called, I feel bad on the spot having to get the whole, you know, full title, but they're, they're called something to the effect of boarding school, um, boarding school intergenerational uh, coalition or something. They have a title a pretty long one, so excuse me for not um, recalling it right away. But it's an organization that is dedicated, and they were supported and actually based out of Navajo Nation. I know that the Navajo Nation endorsed them. Um, and their efforts, oh, I know it has healing, like boarding school healing coalition. And their effort is to seek healing um, from boarding schools. But again, you know, this is difficult because to some communities, like when I was in the Crown Point, New Mexico community for my forthcoming book, I have a chapter about uh, this community and a boarding school there in my book called The Earth Memory Compass, coming out this fall, <laughs> is um, they were very proud of their school. And they would get, you know, pretty irritated if somebody comes in and says, oh, boarding schools are bad and your school and what you had was bad. And I've looked at old oral histories too, where um, there were interviewers who just almost like fed, um, you know, had those lead to questions where they were like, so you were tortured at the school, right? Wasn't it horrible, right? And I see these in transcripts. So people, I try the best to let people tell their story. I try to keep my, my questions general that one I did sometimes I get specific when I want to learn more specifically about a point that in the case of um, Pauline so for example I wanted to hear more but anyway there are efforts and groups in the United States to bring more recognition to it to you know have more involved with education because there are other countries already doing this already and they have challenges it's not easy you know a straight shot of this is how it goes and and it's all effective. There, there are criticism of how that's playing out, how that's working out. But um, the U.S. is still behind on that, for sure, about um, having these conversations. But it, I see in textbooks more about boarding schools and questions of assimilation being brought up. And for sure, I'm, I'm teaching about it. But you know, the question is, how is it large scale being taught, especially because, uh, as you brought up, these are very recent. It's right, not right. such a long time ago. Forget about it. Right. And even with the positive experiences there, there were still some very negative and, um, you know, horrible, even crimes, I would argue, that happened in, in those forms of education. And sadly, you know, when we're looking at education today, my son tells me about how he's got the thinking walk, and as a form of discipline, he has to walk laps around, and I'm not comfortable with that. You know, I'll say that here, being recorded, that I've been to other places where they discuss and take it very seriously how they're disciplining their children, and this question of discipline is it goes even to college, right? Level of how how do we create a sphere that's conducive to learning, but where do we maybe overstep that? Even myself, I have to be careful 
am I humiliating a student? You know, I don't want to do that. And this is a delicate issue as well that I think boarding school, those examples from the past can illuminate even generally, not just, this is not just a Native American history. This delves into a lot of questions about the United States. We're all on this land that was, is indigenous, you know, to peoples who have been here since time immemorial. And some who have been here, you know, they can trace as Cherokees from Oklahoma when they were removed here, but layers of history to this space that we all are occupying that we navigate and that we can claim as home too. So I think these questions of why why send them to these different schools, what they had to go through, and still questions for Indian education for sure and education generally in the U.S. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Yeah. Let me let me ask you a quick question. I, this is a boarding school, so were the students there year round, or did they go home for summer vacation? Or? Good question. Um, so boarding school, they had the academic year that they were required to be there. So that would be mostly, you know, from fall and they till um, spring sometime. They go home for summer. So, right. but this was another thing that came out. Some people practically stayed there all year round and they would be able to live in the dorm and get jobs like they went and did um that's a whole nother part of this study too is they had different jobs they could do and they had little accounts and that was a part of educating them too they connected that to educating them as they had these little accounts that their families could give them some money but some said you know their families didn't give them any money or anything and um, they would get jobs and they would put it in their account and they would have these little accounts that they managed. And uh, jobs, some had jobs all year round, but especially during the summer months, some uh, like young women would be housekeepers or help take care of the house, be um, child caretakers or um, all kinds of different jobs. Like I, I've come across and talked to people about young men might do something like help in a shop or something. So um, another interesting thing about the arts is they were sort of commercialized is what I have, I'm starting to get evidence of as well, is that they sometimes would create arts or crafts, even like dream catchers or something, and try to sell those. So there was these uh, clear uh, questions there. There were a lot of, um, Peaches being grown in that area. They even have like a festival. And that peaches? was, yeah, peaches. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, peaches. A peach, a peach festival. And um, they could get in trouble if they went into these um, orchards. And some of the students, that was a big issue. And some were threatened, like by the local community, that if they came in without, like, some were actually could work and be paid to do that. But if they came in and took some of those without uh, being asked that they would be shot at, is what some students remembered, they would say they would shoot at anybody who comes in. So these different dynamics there. And some brought up that, um, you know, for holidays, like they, they called it Christmas holiday then, um, even though that's an interesting dynamic too, is the religious component to it because they provided students a chance to worship, you know, with different denominations, but only some that were available, I guess, or, or that, that they had programs for. So there wasn't really one, and there were tension over what if you're a part of the Native American church or want to practice traditional ceremony, what kind of access do you have? And recently I interviewed someone who, who was really awesome of how he said he'd go to the mountains, and that became like his refuge is he go into the mountain and find peace there and be able to have be able to do that like to get away um, even for a little bit um but for the holidays many of them had to stay there you know until summer and that would be the time when they could get a bus be loaded on the bus and go home for just summer months so those were very vital months for a lot of the youth of reconnecting with the community where people like jesse could learn from his father you know were those summer months but they would miss things too like a lot of stories were shared only in winter so not being there they wouldn't have access to some of those stories that that traditionally they would have I know we're over on time. I don't know if anybody else had any itching questions. Over there in Broken Arrow, don't want to completely leave you out. I know I've got like my back turned half of the time. Are you guys good?
Any questions? No. Nope. No, we don't have any questions here. Yeah, thank you for joining us from so Broken Arrow. Thank you, I appreciate it. I look forward to speaking with you um, at a later date regarding your research. And yeah, please do. I'm open to it. I'm still all involved in this. And <laughs> thank you. I would just like to take a moment to acknowledge uh, Pamela and her uh, mm -hmm. group who uh, initiated the Hawk Talks this year. Um, Yay, they yeah. have been extremely Woo! successful, and it's something that I hope we maintain uh, next year, yeah. um, and maybe uh, get some bigger crowds and and more people involved yeah, in it. Amazing. So thank you, Pamela, for leading this effort. Uh, it has you. certainly enriched my life, and I think that it has those that have attended. I, I, I thank you. Uh, those are very kind, gracious words, and uh, I uh, I hope to continue in the fall with the help of the rest of the group who who started this. Sarah and, and Ron to or two of them, and, and Carl Seward. Uh, you get some librarians together, and whew. uh But yeah, I really appreciate the the uh, opportunity to learn from from my peers. It's just amazing how. Uh, you, you go day to day and, and you're just, you have no idea. All the work that is being done. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it's been humbling and, and edifying at the same time. So thank you so much. Awesome. Thank Plus you. Plus Circle of Excellence. Okay. We haven't signed up for that. Uh, we have an honoree here at the table. Oh, uh, yeah. That's right. I gotta get it. Congrats. Congrats. So, 11 to 1 on Monday. Uh, three to faculty. Uh, I'll be sending out an email probably tomorrow. I'll be there. Thank you. you better be oh, that's right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Free, free food is. is I like know. Me. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Thanks for that reminder. Thank you, Pamela. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks for coming. That was awesome. That was, Should I? That was so, what did I do? That was awesome. Stop awesome. recording. And now.